Um, so welcome everyone. Um, my name is Alexander Dale. I'm the lead for sustainability for MIT Sol. Um, it's been a real joy to help put together um, the session, which is the fourth um, NAMPAN virtual session that we've done. Um, this is our first one that is a deep dive, um, and so really content focused and looking forward to the conversation. Um, to get things started, I'm going to turn it over to Barbara Hendry, who's the regional director for North America for UNEP, um, to give us a little bit of context on the network and the goal of this session and some other pieces. Barb? Thanks, Alexander. I hope everyone can hear me. Um, and hello, everyone. It's absolutely uh, wonderful to be welcoming you to this deep dive uh, on ecological connectivity organized under the umbrella of the North American Marine Protected Areas Network, or NAMPAM. I want to say a special thanks to our organizers uh, and really give a shout out to the Canadian government for um, their particular support for this deep dive. And as ever to MIT Solve and Alexander for facilitating the session. Uh, as Alexander said, I'm the North America Director for uh, the Regional Office for North America for UNEP, UN Environment Program. Hopefully most of you know us by now, uh, but for those who don't, we are the lead agency within the UN system for addressing environmental challenges and we work with countries worldwide, uh, among other things, to help protect our vital global ecosystems. Uh, we're also supporting NAMPAM, working in close collaboration with Canada, Mexico, the United States, and the Commission for Environmental Cooperation. Uh, our mission uh, through NAMPAM is really to create a strong an active network of MPA managers and practitioners. We want to facilitate and support regional collaboration and by doing that, help identify and address common issues and build partnerships for integrated conservation efforts. And of course, we want to share information and best practice. So with that objective in mind, uh, we're here to consider specifically the issue of ecological connectivity. Uh, it's one of the priority themes that were identified in consultation with many of you for a, for a further deeper look. Uh, so we're gonna explore the need for and design of ecological borders that can enhance marine conservation across our three countries. You are all managers, experts, and leaders of marine protected areas in your regions. So we really hope this discussion is of genuine value to you. Uh, and on that note, let's get started. Thank you very much. Alexander, back to you. Thank you so much, Barb. Um, I'm going to turn it over to get us started. We're going to open with a short conversational panel looking at ecological connectivity from three different sectoral lenses. I'm going to introduce that and moderate the panel. I'm really delighted to welcome uh, Andrew Rhodes. And uh, Andrew, over to you. I'm Andrew Rhodes, coordinator for the HAP panel for the Naval Code Economy. I use first in all IUC and of the connectivity considerations in this group. And today I will serve as the moderator of ecological corridors that can enhance marine conservation across the seascapes of Canada, Mexico, and the US. And so, to build peer connections to enable future collaboration. As many of you may know, the IUCN's guidelines for conserving connectivity through ecological networks and corridors has been recently published and includes guidelines on the best available science and practice for maintaining, enhancing, and restoring ecological connectivity among and between protected areas and other effective area-based conservation measures and other intact ecosystems. For the first time, this publication introduces a common definition and recommends form, formal recognition of ecological colors to serve as critical building blocks of ecological networks in conjunction with product, protected areas and OECMs, as they are known. It, is all, it, it also includes 25 case studies. If you did not have time to review it previously to the seminar, I strongly recommend you to do it afterwards. It's translated to 
from French and Spanish as well. I had the honor to participate in the Spanish translation. And it, it is important to mention and highlight that there is also plenty of material on OECMs in the IUCN WCPA website. We recently had a, a webinar on this topic for Latin America together with the Secretariat for the Convention on Biological Diversity. Now, my dear friends and colleagues, amigos míos, now I'll, I'll, I'll introduce you to our panelists. First, Ana Metaxas, professor at the Dalhousie University. Then Ben Haskell, deputy superintendent of Stellwagen National Marine Sanctuary. And finally, a colleague of ours, Jorge Torre, executive director and co-founder of COVI, Comunidad y Biodiversidad, an NGO here in Mexico. So I'm gonna jump right, right, right into it uh, because time is, is, is of an essence. So, and I'm gonna start with you. Um, your, your, your work focuses on multiple and complex aspects of ecology. Can you talk to the audience about how researchers and managers might think about the topic of connectivity in a different way? To you, Anna. Sure. Thank you. Um, so, Alexander, you can hear me okay? Yeah, perfect. Uh, so, thank you very much for the invitation to sit on this panel. It truly is an honor uh, to do this, and hopefully, I can be helpful as well rather than just honored. Um, so, I guess the first impression that I want to bring forward is this whole concept of ecological corridors. When I, as a marine ecologist who works on things that have um, small propagules, small larvae, uh, the animals themselves may be large, but but the the the, the mechanism, the the, the propagule that connects populations is very small. When I look at the IUCN ecological corridors document, what I see is a document that applies very much to um, large, uh, you know, charismatic animals, uh, mostly on land, and then a little bit in the sea as well. Uh, but the rest of the not charismatic or less charismatic biodiversity is really hard to think about in terms of you know how how they will be how connectivity will be helped by placing an ecological corridor. Um, there is the statement about um, uh, stepping stones, and that's perhaps one way forward. But the actual concept of an ecological corridor may not be directly applicable. Um, so I guess what. Uh, I wanted to talk about a little bit as the science manager conundrum. So as scientists, and I am a scientist, um, we have a pretty good idea about what connectivity is, how to measure it. A lot of effort has gone into it in the last decade or so to try to get a handle on, on different ways of measuring it and, and understanding why it's important. And so while we have some idea of why it's important and everybody sort of claims this, you know, you need connectivity to ensure population resilience and, and, you know, recovery from perturbations. There's actually very few studies that have tested this, right? So that's the science. We know theoretically it's important, but we actually have not run the experiment where, you know, we go out there, we look at species that are disconnected, connect them and bam, everything comes back. Um, however, I, uh, my PhD student actually did a review of, of MPA uh, management plans from 776 marine protected areas and eight marine protected area networks uh, from countries with relatively advanced conservation planning. So Australia, California, Canada, uh, 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 Hawaii, the UK, and a few others. And what she found was that although we all talk of the talk of connectivity, we actually don't practice the walk. And so what she did find, what we did find in that study was that actually only eight of those marine protected areas mentioned connectivity, and those eight were really mostly in California and Australia. And, and so there seems to be a disconnect about science saying it's important, management now saying it's important, but actually implementation not following the pace. And um, and so there's also a difference in how it's measured, how the few cases where it has been assessed, how managers have, you know, what types of connectivity they measure versus what types scientists favor. And so what we try to do is try to understand why. Why do we have this gap? Why do we all say connectivity is just so important and we must, and it's the flavor of the decade now, but somehow it just doesn't happen. And so um, I think there is three reasons this is actually happening. The first one is because 
is because connectivity is really hard to define. So the scientists all sound like we're in agreement about what connectivity is, but you ask, you know, a thousand scientists, you're probably going to get a thousand different answers about exactly what connectivity is and exactly how to measure it. So it's really hard to define connectivity. Um, the other thing is that it's very hard to measure and can be some elements. So genetic connectivity can also be expensive to measure. And so it's not a tool that is easily accessible that, you know, managers can have the data, the fingerprints to make decisions. And the third problem, I think, is that it's really difficult to set a target. So we have targets for percent, you know, area that we want to protect. And we all say, oh, and they have to be connected. But how much? A lot? Little? What is well connected? What isn't well connected? You know, and how do we decide, you know, should it be 20% connected or 50% connected? So connectivity in its essence is not really an attribute of the network, it's more sort of a process that then leads to an attribute, which is the resilience of your protected area or your network uh, of protected areas that will actually be the consequence of connectivity. So we need to measure the consequence. The target is the consequences. So that makes it a little bit complicated for a manager to wrap their brains around that. And so what we proposed um, in that study is that what we really need is managers and scientists need to sit down and develop a framework that it can allow this language to happen so that, that we can really think about when do we need to account for connectivity, because maybe we don't always need connectivity. Um, and then how are we going to do this? How are we going to make sure we have connectivity? And importantly, how are we going to measure it? How do we know we got it? Um, so how are we going to evaluate it? Um, so I know my five minutes are probably up, so I'll stop there. Thank you, Andrew. Yeah. Thank, thank you very much, and uh, you just brought some very good ideas and experiences to to the table. And but now moving towards somebody on the on the field, um, more in more in let's say on 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 the on, on the field of, of of a manager, Ben Haskell, uh, could, could you tell us a little bit about the C Sister Sanctuary program and its success in protecting whales as as a concrete example? And obviously, if you can add into this. Uh, element, um, obviously, the, the agenda of climate change, things are moving. Um, so, uh, back to you, Ben. Okay, thanks very much, Andrew. Can you hear me okay? Okay, good. Um, yeah, thanks for uh, the opportunity to address the group. Um, it's very um, appropriate given that tomorrow's Earth Day. So, happy Earth Day to everybody out there. Um, yeah, I'd like to uh, give you the sort of manager's perspective on uh, marine connectivity with a very concrete example of the uh, North Atlantic Humpback Whale Sister Sanctuary Program that um, that we at Stellwagen Bank National Marine Sanctuary initiated in 2006. The um, Sister Sanctuary Program or, or network was established to facilitate the effective management of a shared population of protected humpback whales across jurisdictional boundaries throughout its migratory range from the feeding grounds um, where I am at Stalwagen Bank Sanctuary to the breeding grounds and nursery grounds in the Caribbean. Um, in the U.S. waters, these whales are protected by the Marine Mammal Protection Act, as well as the National Marine Sanctuaries Act. Stowagen Bank Sanctuary itself is uh, 2,180 square kilometers of um, a multi-use marine protected area established by the United States Congress in 1992. So it's a holistic um, protection, ecosystem-based protection, um, MPA, uh, that doesn't just protect humpback whales, but um, the whole suite of uh, species and the uh, ecosystem that they live in. Um, the sanctuary, as I said, initiated the Sister Sanctuary Program um, in 2006, and to date, the program involves four other uh, countries, the first was the Dominican Republic, um, and then the French Antilles came on, um, followed by Bermuda, and then the Caribbean uh, Netherlands. Um, 
And this uh, program, the sanctuary, the sister sanctuary program is a pioneering program in support of the United Nations environment program, specially protected areas and wildlife marine mammal action plan for the wider Caribbean region. The initiative uh, has established the world's largest distributed network of marine mammal protected areas. The uh, program increased protection from 2,180 square kilometers um, existing in 2006 to now uh, over 669,000 square kilometers since uh, 2015. So as additional sites join, this network of sister sanctuaries will help to ensure a safer future for the uh, North Atlantic compact whales. The successful collaboration was achieved through education, conservation, science exchange, and improving communications, as well as aligning priorities um, and enhancing resource sharing. These, um, these whales, as they travel from the Caribbean up north to the feeding grounds, face a number of threats, primarily, at least in U.S. waters, entanglement and fishing gear is a uh, huge problem. Um, getting hit by ships is another um, important problem that, um, that these whales face. And increasingly, noise is an issue um, in terms of, um, of masking their communication um, abilities. And um, the problem of uh, tour tourists loving them to death is also sometimes a problem um, in terms of um, small boats getting too close or hitting whales, um, commercial whale watch operators um, uh, behaving poorly and dangerously around whales. Um, the requirements um, to be a part of the Sister Sanctuary program is that, um, that we have a shared population, that um, there's the establishment of a formally designated Marine Mammal Sanctuary, or MPA, and the signing of a mem memorandum of agreement, uh, bilateral agreement between the U.S. and these other um, four countries. Um, <clears throat> the, uh, the benefits today to this program are uh, building capacity for conservation, uh, expanded protection, scientific collaboration, policy formation, and um, hopefully better management, um, which is something we are striving for. Um, <clears throat> in terms of uh, climate change, um, and um, in migratory quarters, I think we need to um, use predictive modeling and scenario modeling to understand the likely um, scenario based on, um, on obviously a warming planet and warming ocean about how species are going to shift um, and try to predict and uh, prepare for potential shifts, major shifts in migratory pathways and make sure that the countries involved in the migratory um, or in the um, migratory corridor uh, or the potential new corridor are prepared um, to offer um, protections to the shared population of whatever animal they're dealing with. So, <clears throat> Um, I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ben. And uh, turning up to to our our next panelist. And before that, Jorge, uh, I had a very bad idea uh, some some weeks ago that I bought a, a little chick, and that chick has grown. It's a rooster. So if you hear a rooster behind me, I apologize beforehand. Um, now, um, again, it's not only the internet. There are also other other elements around us. So, Jorge, it's it's a pleasure to see you. Um, we always talk about ecological connectivity, but there's an element on, 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 on the social aspect, economical aspect that we also have to bring into the table. To, 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 to the table. So, Jorge, how, how do you bring communities into the planning and success of MPAs and explain the connection between different sites? So, 
bring us to the table the, the social aspect of connectivity. So back to you, Jorge. Thank you very much. Muchas gracias, Andrew. Thank you very much for the invitation for this panel. Um, I hope everybody is safe and healthy as possible these days. Uh, I'd like to, to talk about uh, an experiment that we started in 2014, uh, where between two communities here in the Gulf of California, Sea of Cortez, that each community, Puerto Libertad and Valle Aquino, are separated between 150 kilometers, a straight line in the coast. Uh, both communities are small fishers, they fish uh, several species, but we concentrate in one species, a group, leopard grouper, that is very common uh, species to commercial species here in the, in the area. And the experiment was to, I, I don't know if you can present the slide, uh, Dale, that I, I have it, but um, the idea was to work with the fishers to explain how they impact each other when they are fishing the same resource. And in this slide is, this is a, 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 a finally is in the second round, is to be published this year. Uh, it was a multidisciplinary team, but the, the main goal was to combine social connectivity with ecological through genetics connectivity. And once, so we train fishers from both communities to take samples or genetic analysis of these species every time that they were fishing. They have a GPS, they have vials to take the, the sample, and then we send to, to the expert to analyze the kinship, the maternity also between the groupers. The, the, we sample, they analyze around 282 samples, and we can see that some mothers of one of the fishing grounds that are used one by by one community are the, are the mothers of the daughters and son of the the ones that are fishing by other community. We see that the majority of relations were more mainly second degree relations between in, in the groupers, but then we interview. Uh, 83 fishers from both communities to understand their relation, kinship relation, if they are cousins, friends, and also how they communicate between both communities, and how they exchange information, and how they recognize leadership. And we, we so then we construct both connectivities um, networks, the genetic connectivity with the groupers, and the social connectivity with the fishers. And then we combine them. And we found that fishers from the two communities frequently capture fish that were second degree relatives from the same stock. And we present these results to them so they can, they know, fishers they already know, but when they see and participate in the experiment and see the results, they are, were much more engaged and more um, open to start to collaborate between communities. Um, uh, also, despite their fish, uh, the fishing zones not overlap because both communities fish in different areas, the ecological links between communities were as important and links with the same community. Um, social high communication, uh, the social, so, uh, they, they have a high communication between two communities, but the kinship and leadership were low. And so, so this example uh, sounds probably complicated, complex, but was a very easy to do, a straightforward experiment, a very tangible way to explain communities, humans, how we are connected. And every time that I'm doing uh, fishing, uh, every time I fish in something, I am impacting in some way another community, a friend or a family member. 
So that is the experiment that I, I would like to, that, that I wanted to present. And the, 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 the importance that we can think about connecting uh, species and corridors, but it's so important all the time, including human aspects and how they are connected. Because we have all examples where connectivity between humans can produce bad things, like they communi communicate between them and then go and feed over fish other areas. So how we can um, use this information in a better way to, to improve connect ecological connectivity. And I think five minutes, maybe? Yeah, thank you, thank you, Jorge. And I'm, I'm gonna turn really fast to, to let's say, a, a, a lightning round. I'm going to call it a fire round. So you have you're going to have what literally one minute, one minute to give your main recommendation to the managers today and on 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 this on on, on this webinar. Uh, you're you're having a beer with them. What will be your main recommendation on ecological connectivity, including some of the aspects that you just mentioned, uh, Jorge, Anna, uh, Ben? So please, I'm going to start with Anna. What will be your main recommendation to, to the managers here today in, 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 in the audience? So uh, my main recommendation will be to decide to for the managers to um, decide what kind of information they need from science to be able to assess connectivity and to be able to incorporate connectivity in their design. What what do they need? Perfect, Anna. Ben, to you. Main recommendation. Yeah, um, my main recommendation is to only implement um, uh, corridors or or um, explore or implement uh, connectivity when you are quite sure it's going to make a difference. Because we have enough paper parks out there, we don't need more paper parks. We need. Uh, actions to make a difference. Thank you. Excellent, Ben. Jorge. Um, my, main, my main recommendation is that please managers be systematic. Just uh, managers are dealing with so many things in MPAs, but in case of connectivity is if they want to connect with, start connecting with other MPAs, it's going to be a long process. So just keep be systematic and and, and have few few data, but con all the time doing the systematic way of obtaining them to connect them. Thank you, Jorge. So, as a, as a wrap up, my dear colleagues, friends, amigos, uh, Anna took us in a I, I will say two two big interfaces. The first inter interface is, is the interface on science policy no, on connectivity, and then the second phase interface is a policy action. Uh, she highlighted obviously that we have some examples from the interface on, on science to policy to identify connectivity in different instruments, different PAs, different systems, and some very few examples on the other aspect on moving towards implementation. That That is, the, 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 the I think, the, the highest and the more complicated challenge nowadays, move into the action, move into the implementation. Uh, ben, ben showed us that there are already examples, international examples, on uh, how to enhance connectivity through charismatic species and, and groups and populations. So we can obviously take advantage from that. Then Jorge took us into a very interesting aspect of, let's not forget how to bridge also, uh, I, I will call them, empathy breaches on social and economic aspects of connectivity and, uh, and, and, and into many countries that is a very important factor so uh, without any doubt uh, this has been uh, a very interesting interesting session and obviously I invite everyone to take a look to the guidelines of WCP and AIUCN on connectivity OECMs and many other things that are are very 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 relevant so finally and before passing to the working groups I just wanted to highlight that this is more than a deep dive it is a huge and great opportunity in challenging times for all MPA managers and allies to work closely together towards protecting our oceans let us not forget that the United, United Nations has proclaimed a decade of ocean science for sustainable development this decade. 
until 2030 to support obviously the efforts to reverse the cycle of decline in ocean health. The three countries, just to highlight also, are partners of the Global Coast Gear Initiative. Uh, just last year, the US and, and Mexico uh, uh, confirmed its participation into this initiative. Also, Canada and Mexico are members of the High Level Panel for Sustainable Solar Economy. So, in general terms, there is a momentum moving forward uh, uh, for the oceans. So, together, the US, Canada, and Mexico can, and without any hesitation, help to address any challenge if we, my dear colleagues and friends and amigos, work together. So, Alexander, back to you. Thank you very much. Perfect. That's a perfect link. Thank you so much. Um, Atlantic groups. There are three of you, so I'm going to uh, ask which of you is, is jumping at the gun to talk. Alexander, we, we had a great conversation. Can I jump in? Please go for it, Lauren. All right, thanks. I think two take home messages. One, that there is so much more than the US and Canada can be doing together. We learned a lot uh, about the work that each country is doing. And secondly, that we need a, an inclusive but pragmatic definition of connectivity. We need to be thinking about real conservation outcomes and working backward from those rather than having a more abstract or theoretical approach to connectivity. Um, and, and we need to also be thinking about it in a variety of spatial scales from across um, biogeographic regions to other parts of the world. Perfect. Um, the other two Atlantic groups, I hope that you will chime in after we go through each of the different regions. Um, next, I'm going to turn to the three English Pacific groups and then the uh, Spanish Pacific group and the bilingual Gulf group, which if you wanted to report back in Spanish, that would be great. Um, Pacific English groups. So Karen, uh, Daniel or Carlos. Um, I'd, I'd be happy to represent Daniel's Pacific English group. Hi, I'm Sarah. Perfect. Um, I'm on the MPA management program for the California Department of Fish and Wildlife here in California. So I was able to give kind of a summary of the connectivity work we're doing here in California and the take home messages that I got from our group were really how to expand the work we're doing here to our neighbors, um, both in the US and internationally based on the resources that are available to them. Um, so looking at, you know, different level of resources and how to integrate that into the connectivity work. And then the other kind of take home message really was how to integrate the connectivity work with a lot of the social connectivity that goes on, um, especially around sort of enforcement and compliance issues. Perfect. Thank you so much. Um, our Spanish specific group. That group doesn't exist anymore. Like, oh, that's right. We, yeah, we dissolved so. it into the other yeah. ones. My apologies. <laughs> Um, our bilingual golf group then. Gracias, Alexander. Eh, 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 fue muy concreta la, la discusión. Eh, prácticamente identificamos diferentes esfuerzos que se están haciendo, al menos tres grandes diferentes esfuerzos de mucho, de mucho tiempo que, que algunos tienen ya eh, trabajando en el Golfo. Y también identificamos necesidades. Una principal, por ejemplo, una grande, es encontrar en esta área geográfica la relación o, o la conectividad con, con, con Canadá. Está, trabajamos muy de la mano Estados Unidos y México, eh, pero no se tiene esa conectividad con Canadá tan fácil en el Golfo de México. Eh, otra necesidad que identificamos es, bueno, la, la, la necesidad de incluir a Cuba y la necesidad también de eh, tener protocolos estandarizados de monitoreo que pueden ayudar a hablar en el mismo idioma entre estos entre los países conectados. Y a su vez encontramos también incluso oportunidades, por ejemplo, una manera de conectar a Canadá con, esta, con, con, esta, con este esfuerzo, perdón, a, a Cuba, a Cuba a través de Red Park, es un esfuerzo que también ya tiene mucho tiempo, un foro que tiene mucho tiempo y que puede incluir a Red Parques, y algo que identificamos y que, bueno, precisamente se está eh, construyendo hoy día es esta necesidad de, de relacionar a manejadores de áreas y también a manejadores de áreas con expertos. Y listo. Gracias. Um, thank you for that. Are there, we have now heard from all of the different regions at least once. 
I would love to hear, I want to open up the floor for at least a few minutes to hear if there are other responses to some of what you heard. And if groups have key points that didn't, they didn't get a chance to share, um, you're welcome to share those. And you can also put them in chat so that others can see them. I know that we had one group already that put it in um, to talk about networks being far from complete. If you have those notes written out, it's great to add them so people get a sense of some of that discussion. Um, if you want to put your hand up, that way I can queue up to people who want to talk. That would be great. And as before, keeping your comments brief. Chantal? Uh, I'm going to do the report in en français. Je parlais en français. Alors, dans notre groupe, une des choses qui a, qui a été soulevée, qui n'a pas encore été soulevée, c'est que c'est dur pour des sites individuel d'avoir la capacité et le temps de travailler sur la connectivité en collaboration. Alors, le besoin d'un groupe qui, qui coordonne et qui aide les sites individuels à, à travailler sur la connectivité ensemble, c'est aussi une approche par espèce ou multi-espèce. Alors, l'importance de la connectivité terrestre côté marin pour certaines poissons. Alors, ce n'est pas juste marin, mais vraiment une, une approche par espèce. Fantastic. Um, any other comments en français while we are here? All right. Uh, Karen, I'm going to come to you. Thank you. Um, just very quickly, uh, my group also raised the huge opportunities to look at co-management arrangements with Indigenous partners, particularly some that are happening in the Arctic and the um, Pacific Canadian coast, but also the opportunities to think about connectivity with other sectors, including fishers um, and um, the tourism industry and the roles that they play, especially in places like Mexico, that could be brought in um, to help, you know, by community, um, you know, something we've been talking about by community buy in into this idea. Um, and so just not, there are lots of case studies that I think we could start to share between the three countries on those, uh, you know, both sectorial and other sectorial involvements and co-management arrangements with Indigenous partners. Fantastic, thank you. Uh, and Gabrielle, thank you for putting those comments in the chat. And to uh, Monica as well. Any final comments? I want to close with some thoughts from our panelists, but uh, if other participants have thoughts they want to add in, now's a great time. All right. What we'd like to finish on is asking our panelists who are part of these different breakouts and come from these different perspectives, what they have heard and what they're taking away from these conversations. Um, so looking around, um, Andrew, I might go to you first as, as the moderator um, to, to start, come back to you to start. Um, and then we'll go through uh, Anna, uh, Jorge and Ben. Andrew, do you have any uh, initial responses to what you've heard in the past hour and a half or past hour? Yes, Alexander, and, and thank you for all, and obviously letting me be part of the of the discussion, at least in the Pacific group. Um, there is, without doubt, three three elements that I heard in the conversation. One element is obviously the challenge in, in terms of uh, science and opportunity, mm -hmm. let's say, and the mandate to do to do this work. The other one is, without any doubt, current initiatives and movements that are opportunities that are out there to, 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 to deepen and, and, and continue the work. But there's, and, 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 and in that sense also, and, and Luisa Figueroa has said it very clearly, I want to just repeat that, that, because I think it's very important. There's different layers and scales to connectivity, and we need to obviously embrace and understand that complexity also. Um, the importance of alliances and cooperation uh, without any doubt, that's that's fundamental. California and our colleagues from the U.S. Uh, uh, gave very good ex examples of different corporations and, and, and coalitions that helped them move forward in 
connectivity agenda. So I think that's that's very relevant, and very interesting. Uh, the government is not the, the only actor in this agenda. So obviously, see that as, as an element of continuity and uh, transboundary cooperation. And finally, uh, Alexander, if I, if I may, um, one aspect of compliance. You no, know, there's there's this um, need to fully implement and effectively manage uh, MPAs uh, sometimes before thinking about connectivity. So th there's there's this worry about uh, expansion and more MPAs uh, without uh, 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 taking into account the need of, of, of transiting from paper parks and uh, and low compliance uh, MPAs towards uh, towards to, to that aspect. So in, in general terms, uh, thank you, Alexander, for for that. That's I would say my takeaway message. Fantastic, thank you, Andrew. Anna, coming to you. Sure, thank you. Um, so I guess I would like to reiterate what Chantal said. Um, what I heard and, and what I've experienced is this need, and, and Andrew said it as well, is this need, this is a complex problem and it's gonna take you know, a lot of different actors to get together to address this problem. Um, you know, we heard that most management happens at the single, or a lot of it happens at the single MPA level, and obviously that's not connectivity. So I think one thing that is loud and clear is yes, all these different sectors have to come together, but there has to be a structure that is put in place to facilitate that because everybody's away doing their own thing and and days go by and and so you don't think about it. So there has to be some structures that facilitate that come with funds, presumably to the governments uh, that can facilitate this process. Um, to bring people together, connect people so they can address connectivity. And I just would like to leave again with one final thought, which is, you know, connectivity is not necessarily have to be there all the time, right? So we need to be able to sort whether we need to worry about connectivity or not. So I know it's out there, but it may not need to be integrated or, or, as part of an NPA planning process. So that's also something that we need to think about. Fantastic. Thank you for that. Uh, Jorge, coming over to you. Or Ben, if you have, if you're ready to go, it sounds like you're, you want to share some thoughts with us? Sure. Um, so uh, I'm feeling a, a real sense of urgency um, with the loss of species every day and many species on the verge of extinction. Um, I think that requires that we be really uh, strategic and tactical in what we take on um, and, and try and take on initiatives that have a good chance of success in protecting the species that, that we care about. Um, and that requires incredible coordination and communication between the parties and sectors. And um, my takeaway from our Atlantic discussion was that there's so much more we could be doing just with Canada, um, but also between um, the North Atlantic countries and the Caribbean. So, um, uh, and it's also um, the other thing I'd point out is that, you know, we're all focused on our particular areas that need a lot of care and attention themselves and um, trying to focus on a, a broader problem um, um, almost requires a, a dedicated um, effort and new staff uh, to be able to take that on. And a lot of us don't have the resources uh, and the funding and the staff to do that. So, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, Jorge, I'm sorry that you can't hear us. Um, and so for everyone's reference, Jorge's put some final comments in the chat. Um, so make sure that you see those. Um, we Maybe are I... at time. Oh, sorry. Yeah, okay. go for it. Uh, I have them here too. His recommendation of Jorge would be to clearly map in the three countries, the efforts we're doing in connectivity, and from there, see what we can connect between each other. 
maybe in a in a time lapse on a time of three years that he suggests, and also for my colleagues of Conamp, he kindly asks, he suggests to be systematic in, in whenever possible. Thank you. Thank you, Monica, for jumping in there. Um, I'm sorry we had a little bit of audio troubles there. Um, I'm going to close us there and thank everyone for spending an hour and a half here. I want to respect that time that, you, that you've given us and know that we will, I think, do more of these. There's clearly a lot to learn. There's clearly a lot to connect around. Um, and there's so many other topics that we could also talk about. Perhaps we will try to do a little bit longer in the future. So we have a little bit more time for discussion either at the group level um, or at the cross group level at the end. Um, I, before you all go, if you can all come on video if possible, and I'm going to take a photo of everyone. So we get a, a if everyone can you know, expand my video and then try to take um, as a picture of as many people as possible. Um, and so if everyone wants to smile and wave, um, perfect. Can I take one more? Thank you. Thank you all for being here. Um, I'll stick around in case you have any lingering questions that I can answer. Um, and otherwise, you can look forward to a recording with transcripts um, in all three languages that will be posted on the NAMPAN site. And hopefully that is the first of many case study spaces. I know we also have many examples and reference points that people have shared. We'll aim to share those as well in the final report and on the website. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Alexander, for facilitating us so brilliantly. Of course. And um, one final thank you as uh, the, uh, to the interpreters for spending the time and dealing with us jumping back and forth between all of our languages. Thank you, everyone. Bye bye. Bye bye, all. Everyone. Thank you, Alexander. And of course, thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.